Okay, so we're broadcasting now, Aaron? Yes. Okay, so, uh, yep, we do have one person. Uh, Ted Parker is actually here. Um, so oh, one good. person from the public. And so tonight is August 26th. Uh, this is the Amherst Conservation Commission meeting. And so why don't we just start off by going down the agenda. Um, so as Aaron was saying, Dave is not here. Um, there's no comments for me at this point. So Aaron, do you want to take it over? Sure. Sorry, it's a little, it's a little confusing because I've got, um, I'm remoted into my work computer in order to get all access to all my documents. So hopefully you guys can see the agenda here. Yes. Okay, so 710, um, I, we are expected to have a presentation from um, uh, Hannah from uh, Coles. She works for Coles um, as part of the, um, uh, the storybook trail proposal at the Mill River. Um, and since that's not on yet, um, maybe I'll just jump into some other business. Um, that's kind of land use related. Um, at the last meeting, we had gotten a request um, from an individual who wanted to create an outdoor education program for young children um, and use conservation land. She had proposed using the um, Hitchcock Center in Larch Hill. And uh, Dave and I had talked about this offline as we had said we would. And um, what we had come up with, and this is a totally up to the commission obviously, but what we had suggested was that we approve for one season and for the program to be at the Mill River Recreation Area um, because there are public restrooms there. Whereas at Hitchcock Center that public restrooms are not safe right, right now for the public to use. Um, but Mill River, they're open and running, but that um, if they do proceed, that they would have to follow all COVID, state COVID protocols, and um, that they could only operate when the restrooms are open. And just to, to test it for one season and see how it goes, basically. Um, that's kind of what, what we thought might be a good trial, just to test it out and see if the program worked so it's up to you guys um just to kind of refresh your memory she's proposing to do kind of like a couple hour a day child care kind of program as like an outdoor education component um just to get kids out in the woods and to um really respect social distancing and kind of keeping kids separated as much as possible wearing masks when they have to but just so that kids can have some con safe contact with one another and be outside. Mm -hmm. And you said one season here, Aaron. So that means for the fall? Yes. Okay. And the restrooms there are open in the fall. I know they're open in the summer. I don't know when they close, to be honest with you. Um, um, that's a good question, but um, I can talk to Dave and find that out and we can uh, coordinate with, uh, with the applicant on that. Okay, and they have full insurance? I think I, I think they do. She, she was, she said that she was setting up, you know, full insurance, just like a full childcare program would, um, but that could be a condition as well. Yeah, I mean, we would need that for um, legal issues on our side. And then the other issue I had last time, I don't know where this fell, was what about equal access to people with lower incomes? That's a good question. Um, I can pose that question to the applicant, um, or we could just condition that um, equal access is provided for a low income people as part of the approval. I mean, there's lots of different ways for that to go about. I, I personally wouldn't want to condition that. Uh, okay. I have a 
you know, it could be everywhere from, you know, pay what you can to scholarships to mm -hmm. it's a little dicey. Okay. I can, I can contact her and ask her. Can we just say that we encourage it, not that we condition it, but that we encourage it, Brett? Um, we could. Yeah, I mean, my problem, Laura, is, I mean, this is a fee-based program mm -hmm. on public it, lands. Yeah. Um, you know, and so I would want, I don't know, it just kind of... Yeah, I hear what you're saying. Okay, so Aaron, let us know what she says. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah, because I assume it's some... It's tricky because of it's like, where does she look for guidelines on how she goes about providing mm -hmm. low-income opportunities here? The state is so, so d tough to deal with right now for early education. Mm -hmm. I think um, what Br Brett's saying is maybe just allow some kids to go without, oh, without paying, but I... You're saying if you if you state the low income requirement piece, that's yeah. Um, then you know that's. I mean, yeah, it have to be consistent. Like if we're yeah. gonna ask for a low income requirement on this, every yeah. or fee event that we have mm -hmm. on a conservation land, then we also should do that as a standard condition. I think we. I don't know if we've done it as sort of a standard gen, but I know that we've definitely had this in the past. I, I, I'm not against it. I just, I, um, mm. I think it, it's not, it's a heavy lift for the, for the coordinator to figure out how to do that in a consistent way with state, with the state guidelines the way they are right now. Um, so. Okay. Yeah. I mean, they can come back to us and say it's not feasible as well, but I mean, as long as they try and, you know, make a good faith effort, I'm okay. Okay. So, I mean, there's a couple ways I could go about doing this. I could, we could just approve, you know, make a motion to approve with specific conditions. Um, and, or I could go back and speak to her and say, you know, the commission is amenable to this, but wants to know more information about these specific items. Um, I mean, I know a lot of these programs are trying to open at the beginning of September and our mm -hmm. next meeting isn't until September 9th. So um, that might hold up um, getting started, but um, I could certainly report back on the um, equal access question. And um, really it's up to you guys what you think as far as uh, approval or recommendation. And Aaron, is there any reason that this applicant hasn't attended one of our meetings? I mean, if they just attended one of this meeting or the last one, things would have been a lot easier. And in general, people do attend at least one. Yeah, so um, this land use application came in through Brad um, and I just never had like direct phone contact with the person to invite them to a meeting. In the past, um, sometimes people submitting land use applications came to meetings and sometimes they didn't. So I didn't know um, kind of the protocol, but if in the future, anybody who submits one of these, I should extend an invitation to attend a meeting. I'd be more than happy to do that. I, you know, probably should have explored that before now um, to make this easier, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I think an invitation, it's not a requirement. I mean, mm -hmm. some of these are pretty straightforward, but you know, because they're not here, it definitely delays things is my. I do. I mean, I want to circle back to what Jen was saying earlier around accessibility. Um, and I think that it's something whether for this one or not, because I hear you saying like our next meeting is the end of September and so or mid whenever in September. Um, but I think a larger conversation about kind of a standard standard set of expectations around accessibility uh, would be really worth having if at one point we have a meeting where we can dive into that. Um, around land use. I think that would be a worthwhile conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and it brings to mind a lot of questions too, like just the, the equal access question. I mean, um, as far as like our, our, the cross section of people that are going to be invited to attend, you know, or 
I mean, I don't know. I guess I'm just thinking like this should be like an all inclusive, equal access, you know, everybody welcome to participate kind of program um, as opposed to like exclusive to a certain group of people or something like that, if that makes sense. Um, Cause it's on town lands. Um, I think that that is re very reasonable thing to require. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of, I'm wondering, I mean, is there anything like this for use of like the community center or any other town, not lands, but other town spaces? Is there any sort of precedent here? That's a good, that's a good question. And also, Erin, just to clarify, it's not only like equal access, it's equal ability to afford, like, or maybe this is a clarifying question. Brett, do you mean equal access, like anyone can sign up, or do you mean it should, there should be opportunities for people who would otherwise not be able to afford childcare at this price point to have an option to have financial assistance or have some, some like lower tuition openings, you know, cause there's two things there, right? There's access, like everyone knows about it. And then there's, or there's, how do you cap the size of the class? And then there's like actual economic access. Well, what's, what's, you know, one of the things is it sounds like a reasonably good idea to try something like this. And we are in a time constraint in terms of what can happen. What if we tentatively approve it with some expectation that the next time we meet or thereabouts, the person is going to come back and explain these issues. And if we point out some of the issues, that may all get addressed. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> well, but the problem i mean i like that as a general approach larry the only problem is i think that they want to start this up and so once they start it up the horse is out of the barn at that point we, but uh, the point i was making is that it allows them to begin going and we point out our concerns so therefore they may address those in the process of trying to do this trial thing mm -hmm. i mean we're not you know it's if we point out we've got we, we are, have concerns we're indicating that in the future, this may not occur if, unless these concerns are taken care of. So therefore, allowing them to start because of the kind of constraints we have with these kind of guidelines maybe makes sense. Yeah, and I also, I, I do wonder to echo Larry's point, um, if we if we did delay a decision until September, is that too late for her to start? No? Jen's saying no, I'm looking at your, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know. They're all over the place right now. Like some yeah. are delayed already, like to be consistent mm -hmm. with public schools. Others are opening. Got it. Okay. Yeah. It's it's more about approval from the state. Having a plan that meets meets COVID safety guidelines is okay. really 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 hard on these daycare facilities organizations. Well, I think that 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 in and of itself is a great point. Obviously, that they need to have that state approval, you know, to proceed. Um, I mean, what is the age group that they're aiming for? For some reason, I didn't think it was preschool, though. I thought it was slightly older. But I don't think it may not really matter. <laughs> I don't think it's age specific. I think it's, okay. you know, you have to be a state, state registered program. Well, well again, we could carry it in that way that we, subject to their getting approval by the state, we have some of these kind of conditions we're also sex. concerned with. Mm -hmm. So allowing her to proceed through the getting approval from the state and hopefully addressing our issues at the same time. What, I, what I'm trying to do is just get around the idea that it gets stalled until next year. Yeah. Um, but I mean, is there anything in here that it does need state approval or is that something that she does? I mean, it says that she's following recommendations, but. Yeah, I'm not necessarily saying we require state approval. I'm just saying if state, that's up to her to determine if the program she's creating requires state approval. And if so, that she would need to acquire that prior to. Well, it's not a childcare or a daycare. Parents go. Is what? Yeah, I'm just reading that. Yeah, so it's so not. So ages four to six and their parents. parents. Yeah. Okay. Which for me brings up other accessibility issues, but I'm gonna let it go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, yeah, to be so. honest with you, the fact that it's not a daycare and it's not that kind of program kind of does shift my mindset a little bit because it seems like a different type of program. But what keeps catching me is like, again, the use of public lands to generate revenue for what seems like a really cool program. But I just, I think that that's where my concern is coming in is I think we, we need to pay attention to accessibility of programs that are being offered in our spaces because if they're taking up, you know, a large area of Mill River that's then now not usable by other people coming in, that's something we need to be aware of and make sure that we are accepting responsibility for that decision. Mm -hmm. I'm still waiting on the exemption lic licensure from EEC. So she think this program is going to be exempt from the EEC program guidelines. No, it said up, if you scroll up, I think it said it was following EEC and CDC. Yeah, but right now, stop, 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 wait. It yeah. says, I am still waiting on the exemption licensure from EEC. Yep. This, this paperwork has been with EEC for two months and I do hope it's ready soon. Oof. The stats on like EEC opening for any sort of program, yeah. it's really bad. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and I like the general idea that you had, Larry. Um, yeah, I can definitely support that. So provide some guidelines. Again, state that it is for a single season. You know, make some attempts to, you know, go forth. Um, and so good faith effort and then, yeah, see where it goes from there. Should we make a motion to that effect or do you guys want to just have kind of a consensus and I could invite her back to address some of the questions at the next meeting? I mean, it sounds like she might need to be going sooner though. I mean, again, this is- I'd like to see her begin starting so she can begin doing something about it. In other, okay. in other, what, what, rather than waiting on us before she proceeds. Okay, well then why don't, would somebody be comfortable making a motion to tentatively approve the use of Mill River Recreation Area for one season um, following COVID uh, protocols and... Um, Can I ask a clarifier? Sorry, I'm down this rabbit hole of like, she has what did she say? It's not that many people, right? 11 or something? Yeah. 10, 10 yeah. people, yeah. I think. Yeah. So 10 kids plus parents, parent. Um, okay, and so I guess my question is just, what happens if other people also wanna use the space and the land? Um, I think that that's just my only question around land use in general. What's our mm -hmm. policy around if another group comes in, can they say, no, 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 we have like from here to here and you can't, you know, come in. Not come in the, the Mill River, but. Well, we could put that in a motion that we expect them to coexist with other people trying to use the space. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't sure if there was anything when we are approving land use requests, if that means like exclusive, basically, for that area that they've identified. Thank you. Okay. No. Okay, so do you want me to kind of run through the conditions a little bit that were discussed so that a motion could be more easily made? Okay, so um, <clears throat> tentatively approved for one season, um, COVID protocols would have to be followed um, only to be allowed to be used when the restrooms are open. Um, Um, coexistence with other groups. Yep, coexistence with other groups that they get their exemption or uh, follow the requirements of the state mm -hmm. and um, that we would ask that um, she provide some explanation in how she's going to encourage equal access for low income, equal opportunity for people to attend the program. Considering that it's on public lands. Mm -hmm. And proof of insurance, Aaron, as well. And proof of insurance. So moved. 
Okay, so I hear a motion. Who said that? Is that Larry? Okay. Me, yeah, yeah. So I'm looking for a second. Seconded. Okay, so Leroy seconded. So Anna? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, aye. Leroy? Aye. Larry? Aye. Jen? Aye. Laura? Aye. And aye for me as well. Okay, so you're all set on this one from us, Aaron? Yes. Okay, thank you. So let's see if um, if Hannah is in attendance. Yep, she is. So um, I'm not sure. I'm going to promote Hannah to a panelist so that she can um, speak. I'm sorry, um, which one is Hannah here for? Um, Hannah is here for the okay. um, storybook. storybook trail. Okay. Yep. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, let me get rid of this fake background from earlier today. Oh, we all have to deal with that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you. Thanks for your patience. So welcome, Hannah. And so if you, um, this was introduced to us last time and there was general, you know, um, I think excitement support for it. Great. Um, but yeah, if you can provide some, you know, a little bit of background and some details, that'd be great. Sure, absolutely. Um, did everyone have a chance to, you said, talk about it and read the proposal too, just so I'm not making you all sit through some not me, I, was, I wasn't here okay. last time, so a little bit of proofs of background. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and I'm um, sorry, uh, Hannah, before you start, could you uh, just introduce yourself as well for the record? Oh, yes, absolutely. I'm Hannah Rechtschaffen. Um, I'm the Director of Placemaking for Coles, um, working in the Mill District in North Amherst. Thank you. Um, yeah, sure. So um, my job is centered around uh, usually a lot of events and gatherings and creating spaces that people can gather. Um, and in this time of COVID, I've had to shift quite a lot. So I've been looking for ways to activate different spaces in the community that people can enjoy at their own pace, in their own time, um, in, in ways that they feel comfortable. So um, a story walk, which was actually started um, in Vermont and has been replicated all over the world, is a pretty simple installation, um, usually along an already often traveled path um, that is as accessible as possible and it places pedestals along the walkway and then pages of a storybook, usually two at a time, on the top of those pedestals at a average child height so that they can be enjoyed primarily by children but also by anyone who's using the path. Um, and the great thing about them is that they're designed in such a way that the book can be changed out. So for instance, we would start with one book. Um, our plan is to have it be all local authors um, and maybe some local illustrators as well because it's part of a larger campaign that we're doing in the Mill District to draw more attention to the unbelievable community of authors that exists in Amherst and the Valley as a whole. Um, so you print a book, laminate the pages of it, um, put it on the pedestals along the walkway, and then you can change it out every month. So we'd love to partner with Jones Library, partner with some other bookstores in town, partner with the authors themselves. Um, and the plan is to have the story walk be able to be changed from April until late October, and then the pedestals would be covered in the winter time to hopefully make them last as long as possible. Um, and we have a commitment from Cole's Building Supply to donate the pedestals in kind so they would build them and then also replace them in the future as needed. They're gonna to be on town land. They would be on town land. We, we do have, Cole's does own a portion of land in the Mill District um, on the Robert Frost Trail. And that was where the idea first sort of started. 
but it's just not a trail that is very accessible to children. It's a great hiking trail. I encourage everyone to get out there. Um, but for kids, it's a little tougher. And, and so we were hoping that a space closer in would be more accessible, not only to children, um, but to people who are differently abled. So we just felt like it was a, a smoother path between Mill River Recreation and Puffer's Pond. Okay, and so you're still thinking about a total of 18? Yes, yeah, I think the average children's book, I think will fit on 18 pedestals. Mm -hmm. And then obviously you're dealing with all of the copyright issues and similar. So interestingly, if you purchase a book and take it apart yourself without reproducing any of the pages with the approval of, of the author, if you can get it, especially, um, you're allowed to do it. That's how a lot of libraries have gotten away with doing it. Um, so we do have permission from this first author and my hope is to tell every author that we can, that we're using their book and get them out to do stuff with it. But as far as copyright issues, the way around it is to kind of DIY the pages out of a book. Okay. Yeah, and we actually did something similar for, with the Eric Carl Museum a few years ago. Oh, cool. Um, and cause we actually, conservation land is actually on top of Bear Mountain, which makes no sense, but <laughs> it is. Um, it's beautiful. So. Yeah, so there's a bunch of other ones. Um, awesome. It was similar, but not a whole lot of words, I think. Yeah. Um, so what about the list of authors or books? I, I doubt there's anything controversial you guys are planning, but... We have no con controversial children's books planned. Um, I don't have a list compiled, but I can certainly get you one. We're actually compiling one for another part of this sort of larger campaign. Um, so I could definitely get a list. And then we'd also be open to suggestions if we end up partnering with different groups. Um, There's so many ways that a story walk can like really be plugged into community building. So not just necessary, necessarily literary partners um, right from the get go, but partnering with different local organizations that might have books that appeal to their population um, that they're directly serving. We can draw a lot of attention to different issues. There are so many great children's books out there. So I can definitely provide a list of what we would do. And then we'd be very open to partnering with other groups that might have ideas as well. Um, how, how, about, how about us suggesting you coordinate those choices with something like the Jones Library? Coordinate. I'm not saying, you know, but coordinate definitely. with something like the Jones Library. Absolutely. I can, also, I can also, as a parent, say that some bugs is very equal opportunity to bugs. Like it really features yeah. a wide yeah, array. Yeah, but, but, yeah, but the point the that is, it, it the really is very representative. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's awesome. And we, I put this in the um, proposal, but when I read it back over, it was a little unclear. Um, in non-COVID times, we do a really awesome uh, story hour every week in the Mill District in North Amherst, um, which we partner with the North Amherst Library, um, the most beautiful library building ever. Um, <laughs> we partner with them to come and read stories. So that's another nice thing in the future on ideally the other side of all of this is that if we can get back to story times that are where there's live reading happening, we could even coordinate those books or have the story that's in the woods read to encourage kids to get excited about it and go out and find it in the woods after they hear it from their librarian. So we will definitely keep building that partnership. So mm -hmm. since kids can read a book over and over, we're not worried about exhaustion there. And who's actually, so I heard you say that Coles is gonna be donating materials, which is great. Um, but who will actually be installing and then eventually they will deteriorate and who will uninstall if that's the word? Yeah, we, we can oversee that. And okay. certainly we have a very, um, communicative community. Um, so I'm sure if we have our information, specifically my information out there, probably on the last post, I'll have some contact information should anybody need it. Um, I'm sure we have neighbors who will let us know when things need to be replaced or if anything happens. Yeah, and I'm sorry, Aaron. I'm just seeing your notes now. And so it looks like the Brad or somebody else from the town will do the installation. Yeah, and I, this is from a conversation that I had had with Dave Zomek earlier okay. today. Um, just the design as far as like 
you know, there was multiple designs that were on the proposal itself, like whatever that final design is, like if we could just maybe provide that to Dave, make sure that, you know, he his stamp of approval is on it. And then once they're fabricated, our town staff would install them. But of course, sure. if there was damage or something like that, we, there would be no problem, I don't think, with having contact information to, you know, uh, well, arrange yeah. for repairs or replacements. Definitely. So. And if it's the kind of thing, too, um, if you all let me know who I reach out to, then if I hear something has happened to it, I can certainly contact Brad or Dave and, and just mm -hmm. see if they want us to go out and fix something or if they'd prefer to do it, which is, mm -hmm. at, which is great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> our foresters will really appreciate it because I was like, can someone do this for me? <laughs> yeah, and just uh, from my perspective, um, the town I used to work in, the town of Sturbridge did something um, almost exactly the same as yeah. this. It's probably the same exact program and um, it was wildly successful. The it's kids an, loved it. It's so. an unbelievably light touch easy activation i mean it just people have done it all over the place and it really it's just a nice way to get people outside and also kind of engaging different senses and um this first book some bugs is clearly about neighbors that will be very present in the woods and so there are a lot of different books that can tie into things it's awesome it's really just a fun thing i did one in philadelphia when i was still working there and it just it's so cool and is there going to be any branding on the signs from Kohl's or are there just generic signs like you know, um, by Kohl's or anything like that? Yeah, we will definitely have um, information probably on the last post um, about where everything is coming from. Um, and I, I don't know that we need necessarily to brand every pedestal, but I can also ask Kohl's Building Supply since they are the ones donating the materials if they would like their logo on it or something like that is that something that everyone would be open to i should have asked them yeah i mean i guess i'm personally more in favor i mean i think that who pays for it does deserve credit but it needs to be hmm, at the right level so yeah i mean well, just <laughs> one i think is a great thing okay awesome. i think everyone might be a little much kind of depends on how big it is too but. yeah absolutely they're pretty low key at Kohl's Building Supply. I don't think they're looking for a lot of. I don't think they are. Right. Not right. <laughs> yeah, we do have a question from the public. At, uh, at some yeah. Point. Uh, anything else from any of the commissioners? Okay. Um, so there was um, Kendra. You had your hand raised, and let's see if I can. You can talk. Okay. Uh, can, Hi. You, can, you, really you can you hear us? Yes, we can. Hi. Well, my name's David. I'm actually with my wife, Kendra. And I, uh, as a resident of that area who walks in that neighborhood or in the, on that trail a lot, I love this idea. Um, Some Bugs is one of my favorite books. Um, and we have a toddler <laughs> who loves this book too. There's so many opportunities to learn about bugs and to move your body. It's just an amazing book for so many different ages. Um, so as a, as a resident and a parent, I love this idea. Hannah, I think we've met in passing at um, maybe a farmer's market. I work at the okay. Air Farm Museum. So I just wanted to say um, in that regard, I would be happy to help as a resource in terms of connecting with authors and illustrators, um, yes. making, you know, being a sounding board for different books. And I love the idea of incorporating some kind of programming um, and live events that could be tied in. So we should talk uh, elsewhere. Um, I don't know awesome. if you're providing your contact info in this setting or not. But. Uh, is there a way for me to share contact info? I so think it's the case of Amherst. That's so cool. <laughs> if um, if uh, the gentleman speaking wants to email me, um, and then I can forward it along to Hannah so that you guys can connect. I mean, that's one way to do this. Um, and my email is J-A-C-Q-U-E-E -E at AmherstMA.gov. Got it. Thanks. That is awesome. Tell me your name again. 
David. David. I'm, David. I'm a literacy educator at the. Yes. Museum. Oh my gosh, this is so exciting. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very excited about this idea. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Thank you, David and Kendra. Okay. Um, so anything else that we want to, um, that we, oh, sorry, I'm just, let me just change that. Okay. Uh, anything else that we need to talk about in regards to this? I mean, it sounds like everybody is super supportive of it, Hannah. Um, I don't see any awesome. issues, but some coordination pieces, but you're on top of all of that. So that's all great. Totally. Um, so, Aaron, do you need a vote from us at this point? I mean, it's really what the commission's comfortable with. If you want to make a, a motion to, you know, encourage it with conditions, or if you just want to kind of informally proceed um, and kind of everybody's, there's a consensus amongst everybody that this is a positive thing that we, that the commission wants to move forward with. Well, so aren't, we, aren't we the ones that have to give permission to use the land? So I... <sighs> Yeah. Yes, the commission is the the manager of the land, but I think that Dave and town staff does have some um, management authority for some things. So as long as we know the commission's on board, I'm not sure that uh, a motion is necessary. But it's really at your discretion. Yeah, because we're going to be the ones installing it, Larry, and so I think we're good on right. everything. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think we have full consensus. Just if we need something stronger, um, are we okay? Does anybody want to vote on this? No. Okay. So I can, awesome. yeah, I think this all sounds great. So thank you very awesome. much. Aaron, and if there's something else you need from us, just let us know. Okay. Thank, thank you. All. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Hannah. I look thank forward you. to reading this book, which I have not read yet. So. Oh, it's so great. <laughs> it's so great. You're going to love it. Ben knows. <laughs> I could recite it to you now, but I'll leave you, I'll leave the suspense. <laughs> well, I want to see like some sort of movements apparently too. Okay. So. Dramatic uh, reading. Yes. Don't you worry. <laughs> There's a lot going on in the bug world. There's some drama. <laughs> it even has like a bug index at the end. Yeah. Um, it's so cool. And it's by a cool. local author. She's amazing. Angela De Terlizzi. And she has a new one, Some Pets. It's so good. <laughs> awesome. Excellent. Thank you all. <clears throat> Thank you, Anna. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, so I will put Hannah back to uh, attendee. Okay, um, and so I have 7.40, so we are good to continue with the agenda, um, which I'm just trying to get put the agenda. on my calendar. Um, so 7.30 is a notice of intent, um, and so this is for uh, Eversource and GZA is um, going to be presenting this one. So I will call up. So Aaron, we have not opened this one yet? No, no, okay. this is just opening tonight. Okay. Um, so this hearing is being held as required by, by the provisions of Chapter 131, Section 40 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth and Act relative to the protections of the wetlands as most recently amended and the Town of Amherst Wetlands Bylaw. Uh, this again is by Eversource and this is for the replacement of 36 structures and ancillary activities related to the structures and replacement located within Wetlands Protection Act and Town of Wetlands Protection Bylaw Jurisdiction. Okay, so if you are here to present on this, it uh, looks like Aaron, you, um, you got Robin and Mary and John, nothing. Okay, uh, if there's anybody else here to present on this, if you just want to raise your hand, we can make you a presenter. Um, and if not, um, I'm not quite sure which one of you, Mary, if you're taking the lead today. So if one of you wants to introduce yourselves, give us a little bit of background. Uh, after that, we'll turn it over to Aaron to provide a little bit of background about site visit, and then we'll open it up to the commission and then go to the general public. All right, sounds good, thank you. Uh, I'm Mary Burton from GZA. I'm here with, also on the line, we have Steve Riberty and Robin Cassiopo, also from GZA, and then Jonathan Roberish from Eversource. So again, this project is a notice of intent for the replacement of 36 structures on the transmission line, and the line runs north to south through Amherst. Uh, last year, uh, some select structures were replaced along this line as part of a priority structure replacement project. So for this structure, 
sector, we're going to be replacing the remaining 90 structures and 36 of which are associated with wetlands or resource areas uh, subject to the, this notice of intent. <laughs> but we met with Aaron and Brett this morning in the field and took a look at a few of these areas. The vast majority of the work is associated with temporary matting um, in wetlands and then also some temporary matting in riverfront areas. And that temporary matting uh, will result in no, no permanent impact. This proje project is very similar to the other Eversource projects that are done in Western Massachusetts for structural replacements. So there are some, some new permanent impacts that we have to permit for, um, and so we'll go over those. Uh, we have 620 square feet of permanent impact to bordering vegetated wetland, and that's from the installation of the replacement structures within the wetland. We're able to reduce this, this um, net loss by, by um, removing, planning to remove the footings from the existing structures and do an in situ restoration. So the, the net loss is only 620 square feet of BBW. We also have um, 5,252 square feet of permanent riverfront impact. And that's from the placement of gravel for work paths and access roads and structure replacements within riverfront. There's also impacts to buffer zone. Uh, we've uh, approximately two acres of the gravel work pads will be in buffer zones. Um, and of that two acres, only about 0.3 acres, 14% is located within that 25 foot um, conservation area closest to the wetland areas. We've done, Eversource has done a lot of measures to reduce gravel within that 25 foot um, buffer to the wetland areas. We have demonstrated in our notice of intent that the impacts do meet the performance standards. And so I'm going to turn this over to Steve if he wants to talk about um, our mitigation that we have proposed for this project. And if either of you want uh, Aaron to pull up the plans or anything like that, just let us know. Yeah, hi, I'm Steve Riberty, um, ecologist at GZA for the record. Um, yeah, so before I get into the mitigation, another aspect of the project is um, we're gonna be doing some transplantation of a rare plant um, as part of our permit with Mass Natural Heritage. And some of that's in a wetland as well. Um, so the plant needs to move because it's gonna be permanently impacted and to preserve it, um, for our permit with Mass Natural Heritage, we're going to be relocating it, you know, very nearby. It's just going to be shifted a little bit out of where the matting is going to go, so it's not permanently impacted by the mats. So that will all be hand work and, you know, hand pulling of invasives around where the transplants are going. Um, that, that's an, an additional work item that we're going to be doing. Um, Mitigation-wise, you know, for the um, permanent loss to BBW, the 600 square feet, we're proposing um, a wetland creation on site. Um, it's just south of Strong Street. There's an area there that's already a wetland and right next to that we're going to expand that wetland slightly larger by 1400 square feet to give greater than two to one for the lost wetland. Um, you know the area is pretty close to being a wetland now so we don't have to do a lot of grading to make that work. Um, the, the matted road is going to be right there next to it so it can be easily constructed. Um, and monitor during the construction because this project is going to go on for a little while so that access road will be there if we need to tweak that wetland during construction at all. Um, that wetland mitigation plan you know, was provided today. We had an original wetland that we, we changed the, the concept of our mitigation. So we, we're, we're basically building a wetland as part of this project now, which is now part of this permit. For Riverfront, um, we're doing some a couple different things. We're going to be doing some beaver mitigation off Pomeroy Court, which will be you know, active beaver management during the whole project, which will be probably a year and a half to two years of managing the beavers. Um, I guess it's on the east side of Pomeroy Court where there's a lot of backup and you know issues now that the town hasn't been able to address and it also threatens you know safety issues within the Eversource right-of-way during work. And also we're going to be we're working with the town to help repair the um, the bridge in Amethyst Brook by providing some poles so that bridge can get reinstalled and potentially you know blocking off that short circuit trail that's kind of eroding around on the um, banks 
and you know all the foot traffic that's going over there so once that bridge is kind of put back into operation you know that trail can be kind of cut off and that riverfront area and banks restored along the brook so we're going to assist the town in, in, in that endeavor as well so that's that's the mitigation that we're proposing as part of this project to help offset the impacts that you know the necessary impacts that are that are being you know incurred by the, the by the proposed work Also, I forgot to mention that um, one of the things we looked at during our site walk was an area where Eversource plans to install a permanent bridge over, it's an unnamed stream, um, intermittent stream, south of Bay Road. Um, the permanent bridge would provide access to uh, multiple structures uh, south of there. So we did provide um, Aaron an addendum with um, a bridge specification um, for, that, for that project. That portion of the project. So, anything else, Mary or Steve? Or so, I just want to, if I could, just state for just to um, jump on top of what Steve just said, um, the repair of the bridge at Amethyst Brook is basically because right now, because the brook, uh, because the bridge washed out, people are cutting right up along Amethyst Brook, and the the entire bank of the brook along a huge stretch has had a ton of foot traffic on it and there's no vegetation it's becoming really compacted um, and it's got a terrible undercut and it's just it's becoming really dangerous and also just really damaging the bank of the river so by repairing that bridge and restricting access over the portion that people are walking over um, sort of the reroute, the uh, unofficial reroute area, um, it will be tremendously beneficial. So that's that's one of the reasons why I pushed them in that direction for riverfront mitigation. So I just wanted to state that because it wasn't necessarily explicitly stated. And the parent, when will also... that take place during the project? Come again? When will that take place during the project? Early so on? So from what I understand, the mitigation is going to be happening before the work actually takes place. And that would be the wetland creation and the riverfront okay. mitigation. But correct me if I'm wrong, you guys. Correct. Once once the matted road goes in, we can start building the wetland. So it'll be when the mats go in, but before the poles are going in. And okay. the um, work with the town on Amethyst Brook is, you know, we're in discussions now with the, was it the open space group to try to, you know, connect the dots between Eversource and your folks to, to get that stuff done. Yeah, so he's talking about um, Brad, the land manager, I think is yeah. Who, yeah. who he meant. And Aaron, I, when I downloaded the files for today, I did not get Eversource files that came through. There was a folder, but it was empty. Right. Hmm. I wonder if it didn't upload to OneDrive because of the size, possibly. Um, we did get a revision today. I will definitely re-upload those. Um, so I apologize because I didn't know that that didn't make it in there. Um, so I don't know if there was any other comments from the applicant or do you want to keep moving forward with the site visit pictures and stuff? Yeah, I'd say we go to site visit. Um, without the forms, we're going to have a little, I mean, we're going to need some time to review the actual forms as well. well um, we yeah, so DEP just issued the um, file number comments today. And one of the file number comments was that we need natural heritage approval before we can issue um, the order of conditions. I don't know. Um, I think that they said something like, September 12th was the um, when they were expect to have the review done by um, I don't know is that typical that they take that long or do you think that that might move faster or I guess I'm just asking the applicant it may I, I mean I, t I tried to talk to Lauren today just to get a sense of when you know she's expecting it um, I know they're really backed up with a lot of stuff in front of them right now not just, yeah. us, but just in general there's, there's a lot going on yeah. Uh, so I'm assuming that's probably part of the, the issue, but, um, but yeah, I mean, they technically have 30 days and I think 
Just correct me if I'm wrong. I believe the state mandate on, you know, unlimited timelines is over. And if they have timelines, they have to maintain them. So I don't know when that started up. I think it might've started up during this review window. So maybe that clock, that 30 day clock started ticking, um, you know, at some point in the middle of it. So maybe the September 12th is really when their 30 days end. So I would anticipate it prior to that, mm -hmm. but I, I can't really say when. Okay. Well, either way, we wouldn't be issuing tonight anyways, it sounds like, um, but it would give the commission an opportunity to review the um, revised materials and then um, get comments from Natural Heritage, hopefully before the meeting on the 9th. Now, is that gonna mess you guys up as far as your transplanting of the climbing fern? We don't know. I think there might be other things that might mess up the climbing fern transplantation outside of this. Just we're, we're waiting on MEPA too. So we need, we need MEPA approval to have the CMP in place. Okay. And that's, that's still out there. Okay. Um, so okay. yeah, that, that's a talk to, to Lauren about that. I mean, worst case scenario, the climbing fern transplantation happens next year. I mean, that's not ideal. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're trying to get it done ahead of the project and, you know, I think it, it condenses timelines a little bit next year because you know, we don't know exactly the exact date the project is going to start and we don't want that to have to be holding it up. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if, you know, it came to it, you know, we would try to do it next year if we had to. Obviously, we can't just in the winter. So it would either be probably prior to October 1st or it would then have to wait till, you know, a good, a little bit of a, into the growing season next year. So, you know, it was a good transplantation time. So we won't be transplanting between, you know, October to probably April in that window, there wouldn't be any transplantation. Okay. Okay. So um, these are photos from the site visit today. Um, the photo on the right is a photo of the area where um, where the um, permanent stream crossing would be located and um, just to kind of give you an idea. It's kind of like crossing over. There's a ravine that cuts through here with a stream running through it. Um, so just to um, just, identify just, that. Just for a question, is that tower in the background going to be replaced? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like most of the towers are being replaced yeah. along the yeah, line yeah, at this point. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And yeah, then I know, I know utility lines. I just wanted to know if that's what was going to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, there's actually two sets there, Larry. There's one on the east and one on the west, but the one on the west side is not being replaced. Only the east side. Okay, tower. okay, okay. And they were they came before us a little while ago and they have replaced a few of the towers. Now they're going right. back to the rest, it sounds right, like. Right, right. So the picture on the left is the um, what back here is Strong Street. The railroad track runs <clears throat> this way. And then um, so you kind of come through this cattail swamp uh, from Strong Street. And then this is the area of the wetland replication. And there is wetland on this side. Um, so just to give you guys an idea of that. And in the application materials, um, there is a really nice color photo that um, kind of identifies exactly where the replication area is going to be. And there's also flagging hung in the field there for anybody who missed the site visit, if anybody wants to get out and look at it. Um, yeah, there's parking right along the, right next to the uh, train tracks there. Mm -hmm. So um, a, a butter notification cards were already provided for this hearing, so that's all done. Uh, we had the site visit today to view those two areas, just trying to kind of single out the biggest impact areas, biggest um, from our perspective areas that will need to be monitored and um, protected during construction. Um, one thing that we did discuss in the field um, was having an environmental monitor be present. Um, some of the areas that stood out were the permanent stream crossing area, possibly the temporary stream crossings. Um, the installation of the wetland replication area and work in natural heritage endangered species air, um, locations. I mean, obviously natural heritage is probably gonna have, you know, 
if there's wood turtle or box turtle probably have sweepers out there during construction but um, that would definitely be something I think that would be that we should consider as well in the order of conditions. Um, also, I know from looking at the the bridge plans, it's a prefab bridge that would be um, set into place in kind of piecemeal. And um, one of the things that, um, you know, in speaking in the field, it sounded like the contractor is responsible for determining what kind of erosion controls are necessary. Um, in that particular location for that particular structure, I think straw bales and silt fence would definitely be advisable just to have two layers of protection and something that's a little more substantial than just a straw waddle. Aaron, just to, for, to go on that point, um, so based on one of Mark Stinson's comments was on the, uh, some more detail on that bridge area. So since we're gonna be pushing it out another for the, to the next meeting anyway, we're gonna add some more information to that sheet. So we're probably gonna push the abutments back by like a foot on each side just okay. to get adequate space and we'll show the erosion controls right on that cross-sectional plan of the um, crossing. Great, excellent. Um, so, I mean, and we can come back to these conditions once the hearings continued, but I'm just kind of running through some general ones that um, were discussed and that I think will be needed um, in the order. Um, so a condition for the replication area that it um, remain untouched in perpetuity. Um, it's a replication area to mitigate wetland impacts. So um, it should be written into the order of conditions and be an ongoing um, condition in the certificate of compliance that um, that area is, is basically undisturbed in perpetuity. Um, oh, we also have to specifically outline work that's taking place outside of the work area. So the offsite mitigation, for example, at Amethyst Brook, we'll have to detail that in comments um, in the order, in the special conditions of the order of conditions, just to know specifically what work is taking place and where. Um, and then just noting that the um, specifically for the Amethyst Brook um, riverfront uh, restoration that um, that area they're they're potentially going to be um, donating 55 foot utility poles to build the bridge. <laughs> Staff has also suggested signage and I was talking to Stephen in the field about this today about possibly having you know if Eversource is willing to to create a sign that said something like riverfront re restoration area um, completed by Eversource and that, you know, just to restrict people to, to kind of dis discourage people from continuing to use that area along Amethyst Brook in some way. Maybe, you know, this is a high erosion area and, you know, please don't go beyond this point or something like that. And possibly installation of like a split rail fence. Um, other options would be like boulders or um, brush piles or something to um, discourage people from continuing to use that area. Well, Aaron, yeah, I talked with Jonathan. Every source is okay with providing both of those things. Okay, awesome. Um, so then I guess two other questions I have um, are how would the condition be recorded um, considering this is a right-of-way like what is the plan for recording the order of conditions where will it be recorded and on what property would it be recorded and so forth just to understand that and then um, in the DEP D, uh, we did get DEP file number and there were several comments from Mark Stinson one of them that jumped out at me was number five which was talking a lot about the tree removal and that was something that I think we collectively hadn't really talked about um, a lot of the tree removal in wetlands and how a lot of the forested wetland area is going to be converted and just thought it would be worth asking you guys and getting your perspective on because that's not technically considered filling a wetland or altering a wetland but it is changing a wetland and and um, what you see as being mitigation for that. 
Yeah, we do a lot of work, you know, on other projects like what airports, most notably, where we have to clear large areas of wetland for safety issues. You know, on approach surface to a to an airport, for instance. And a lot of the times, you know, this is different parts of the state, but it's all Mass DEP. You know, they look at it as an alteration, but not necessarily a permanent impact because you're converting, you know, one suite of habitat, you know, forested wetland to another suite of habitats, you know, shrub wetland, you know, which is, you know, not that it's not useful, you know, it's a different suite of species. So you still has, you know, extensive and arguably very good wildlife habitat value. So, you know, I think Mark's comment was more like demonstrate that, you know, what we're doing isn't, isn't necessarily, you know, degrading the functions and values of that wetland, you know. So I think after his comment, I think we can respond to that by the next meeting and, and have, you know, our argument as to why we think it's, you know, not necessarily, I, would, I don't think it's necessarily bad or good that we're converting it. It's just a conversion of one habitat type to another, um, you know, obviously that, mitigation on that is, you know, open for discussion with the commission if they think there's something that's needed for that versus. Okay. Um, Can yeah. I just ask, is there, is there also tree clearing that's going to be happening in riverfront areas as well? Yes, I believe so. I don't have okay. the numbers in front of me, but there's, there's, it's, it's not extensive tree clearing, but if you add it up over the whole line, you know, it might add up to a large number, but in any one given spot, it's like a couple of trees here and maybe going out, you know, another 10 feet. For the most part, the right of way is pretty well maintained. Yeah. Um, here too. I mean, the only reason I bring that up is like we had a little distribution project on State Street where they were taking down, I think, like 20 trees and we were required, I think, $1,500 for plantings to plant in the Cushman Brook or Mill River um, riverfront area to mitigate for the trees being taken down. So I know yeah. you guys are doing a lot already, but that's just something that we've done in the past for mitigation as well. So putting it out there. Well, maybe maybe in the interim between now and the next meeting, if we, I mean, we can quantify what we're clearing in BBW and riverfront and, and you know, maybe you can weigh it against, you know, what's going on and Yep. I mean, granted, we're not going to plant trees back in the right of way. The whole point is to take them out of the right of way. But right, of course. Yeah, if there's absolutely. Some area in town or on conservation property somewhere that could use some additional plantings, you know, we can talk with our source and all, all of us together and okay. come, come up with a strategy that's what makes it, you know, palatable to, to happen. Okay. So those are my questions and comments. I can answer the, uh, your first question. Um, what we typically do for recording an order of conditions is we put the order conditions on the closest substation. So that would be um, Amherst substation on College Street is what we would typically um, thought, uh, register the order conditions on. Okay. Because it is ever source property. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and Aaron, um, would you mind just reiterating how this is different than the North Amherst? Um, oh yeah, the, of course. Yeah, yeah so um, you know, over the last few months, I've been updating the board on uh, multiple, there's two different Eversource projects that are currently um, going to be taking place in Amherst. And so this is one of those projects. And so um, I had been briefing the commission on some of several of the mitigation projects. And one of them was a um, replication area for some um, wetland impacts that are going to be happening at the Poetic substation and we had discussed basically um, creating a replication area on conservation land um, to mitigate for those impacts um, as well as some other things. So I just wanted to point out to the to the board that that project is still moving forward. It's just going to be associated with the substation notice of intent that's going to be coming down the line. So what Eversource did was sort of split the mitigation that the town was requesting and half of the mitigation is being handled by this right-of-way project and the other half is being handled by the substation project. So just in case anyone was wondering why that was that mitigation piece wasn't included in this project, that's the reason why. Thank you, Mary. Okay. So, commissioners, 
comments or questions at this point? Granted, yeah, we there's a bunch of things we're still waiting for, including sort of the plans. We'll get all that before next time. But anything you want want to talk about at this point? I mean, they've done a lot of this before. Um, we've had issues with some of these before, but we've all learned, and so that's one reason that we'll have the environmental monitors out there. I have one irrelevant question for Eversource. This is based on my background. Which, where's the energy, which direction is the energy flow in this one? Where's the energy coming from? Is this from Northfield pump storage or where's, what's the energy flow on this, on this line? Anybody know? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> I, I'd be lying if I told you I did. I know the order of the structure numbers. I don't know if it follows that. <laughs> Well, I'm just one, you know, these, these lines have lived in my neighborhood for a long time, and I would just, and I'm, a, I spent a lifetime dealing with utility and electrical kind of issues, and I should know the answer to this, but I was just curious as to which direction the energy flow is in these lines, and if whether it was related to Northfield uh, pub storage. Anyway, anyway. I'm sorry. Makes no, you I feel don't. any better, Larry, those two sets of lines that are coming from the south, one of those ends, so... Oh. Well, are they both coming from the south or are they going south? No, no, no. One is coming from the south because it ends at the Amherst substation. Okay, that's fine. But what about the other one? Yeah, that I don't know. No okay. idea. <laughs> just curious. That's just, that's, that's just irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other relevant or irrelevant questions? So, <clears throat> one more thing. Well, how, many, how many structures being replaced from the difference from last year or two years ago? A lot. What yeah. was the numbers again? You said yeah, the so, so the total number in Amherst would be for this project is 90. And yeah. 36 of those are subject to, or portions of the those are subject to the, the Wetlands Protection Act, Amherst bylaw. And I don't have the exact number offhand, but we replaced maybe 10 or so in Amherst. Last year. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So much larger. Hopefully we don't have to come back again <laughs> as soon anyway. All I'm, right. sure, I'm sure the abutters will appreciate that. Hopefully they've got at least a 20 year life. <laughs> yeah. well, the ones that we're replacing now are like 60 to 100 years old. Is that right? Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so any other questions from the commission before I see if there is anybody from the public? Okay, so if there's anybody from the public who has any questions on this, if you just want to raise your hand using that feature. Okay, so I don't see it any at this point. As we mentioned, this is going to have to be continued. Our next meeting, I believe, Aaron, is on the 9th. Um, but somebody was saying that there, there's some paperwork we're not supposed to get to the 12th. Potentially, but if we know the meeting's the 9th, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to Laura and I'll see if she can I'll definitely have it before that date. Okay. Yeah, so that's the natural heritage deadline for getting us comments, but usually they're, they move a little faster. Um, but yeah, if we continue to the ninth, I think that that is our, uh, the best thing we could do, because if, if we have the comments by then, then we could move forward. Okay, that sounds good. And yeah, Aaron, after they're uploaded, I can do a check to make sure that they came through on our end as well. So. Sounds great. Yeah, that would be great. Um, and if anyone ever runs into that problem, let me know, because it could have been it was like um, interrupted when I was uploading it or something. I'm not sure why that happened. Yeah. Oh, and um, just as a side note, too, if the commission ever can't locate an application like that on OneDrive, uh, which is the, you know, program I use to share documents. If you go to the Town of Amherst Conservation Commission page, mm -hmm. on the right-hand column, there's a current applications um, link. And so you can go in there and get them off the internet as well. Um, so just let, and I'll upload the revisions to there so that the public can access them. Yeah, thank you for that reminder, Aaron. Yeah. Okay, so do we have a time for the ninth? Yep, so September 9th at 7.35. Okay, I'm looking for a continuation motion. I move to continue this to September 9th at 7.45 p.m. 7.35. 35, sorry, 7.35 p.m. I was so close. I know, I know. you're always. Second. I'm going to second that. So close. Thank you.
Larry, how do you vote? Yes. 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 Yep, yep. Nope, I got you, Larry. You're good. Okay. <laughs> Jen? Aye. So, Fletcher? Aye. Anna? Aye. Leroy? Aye. And I for me as well. So we will see all of you on the ninth. Thank you all. all right. Thank you. Thank one. you. Bye guys. Yeah. Okay, so we will just readjust our panel here. So it looks like you're doing that at this point, Aaron. And so if there is anybody here for the so I think we're on to Tofino, the 745. So obviously Ted is here for that. And so Ted, I will promote you to panelist. Um, is there anybody else here for that besides you, Ted? Oh, hi, Ted. Nope, um, you're on mute at this point, Ted. Hello. Good afternoon or good evening. So anybody else here with you today? No. Okay, so thank you. And so this is a continuation of the notice of intents for Tofino Associates. This is for lots one, two, five, six, and seven and eight. Um, thank you for showing up today, Ted. Uh, we did get the message that you are gonna request a continuation so we've been going through this for a while, so we just thought it'd be nice to sort of check in with you guys and see yeah. where things are at, um, what progress is being made, when we can sort of expect, um, you know, something a little, you know, some, some additional information. And, you know, we as a commission, we meet every two weeks. We're here no matter what, but particularly people from the public, it's, it's a little difficult to follow them. Um, so we want to make sure they have a good opportunity to be involved as well. That makes sense. Uh, so after the last time I appeared before you folks, I uh, jumped right on a bunch of stuff. We got SWCA to go out and, um, um, you know, map very accurately, as accurately as possible, map the, um, the vernal pool. I actually had a site visit with Aaron. Um, I talked with the owners and discussed the entire range of issues that were coming up. One of which was that um, Aaron had brought up during, if not that meeting, the one before, the fact that in the original order of conditions, which was issued in 2004, that there was a replication area and, sh and there was no record of ever having that replication area be, um, you know, uh, um, inspected and, um, and there was no partial certificate of completion um, issued on that. Um, clearly the permit, the, the order of conditions was still open because of the entire issue of the lots not being. Um, so the owners said, well, let's resolve that too. Since we're doing all of this, let's try to get that on the table and get that resolved if it's an unresolved thing. So I also requested um, some, the original uh, approval drawings and that took a, a little while to to, to dig up those drawings. Um, I think that eventually um, um, uh, Beth um, helped uh, Aaron dig them up. Um, and it, in talking through some of the options with the owners, they were, it's a pretty significant amount uh, of, of real estate that they had counted on the income from. So they wanted some time to think about things. Um, we lost some momentum. Um, one of the people who I consult with doesn't, usually I consult with them in person when they come up in the summers from Florida, which they're not doing during COVID. So it's been a little hard. They're not a person who is very good at collaborating in the way that we're collaborating right now. So um, it's making it a bit of a stretch to be able to do that. Um, and I think that's the main part of the delay, really. Um, uh, I, I would like to get it resolved. We have discussed with them we, uh, many, a number of different options, reconfiguring lots, um, combining lots, um, you know, if there are any other solutions that nobody is thinking about, 
but we haven't arrived at anything. I need to push them towards, you know, coming to a, to a resolution, which I am happy to do. I just haven't done it yet. Okay, great. Thank you, Ted. And just to be clear, um, in your request for continuation, you're requesting for the 23rd of September, the later date. Yeah, I was, I was looking for a month, like the, it's to the end of next month. Yep, 23rd is our second meeting. Yep. September. right. So, okay. So, great to hear that progress is being made. Good luck. Yeah, trying to figure out all that <laughs> stuff. It's definitely complicated. And you yep, get that you're the messenger. So. Yeah, yeah, but I'm, I mean, I'm clearly I'm responsible for coordinating it, but I, you know, I just haven't been able to, um, you know, get all the folks into a some s s decision making, um, you know, frame of mind. So, but I'm committed to doing that. Okay, and you're fairly confident. I don't know, <laughs> you're confident that you could do that, or you're hopeful, I should say, that you can do that by the 23rd. I'm hope I'm confident that I can get something that you guys can take a look at. Okay. Um, you know, that that will have some some significant you know progress to show you some the, the mapping will be done there will be some drawings which has uh, vernal pool buffers on it that we can use for consideration by the commission um you know the thing the, the the information that you've requested that you need to actually deliberate in an informed um and useful way okay that sounds great and yeah, I mean, it's been going on long enough. So if it goes on too much longer, the next option would be we wouldn't necessarily need to close the hearing, but we would um, sort of table the hearing. I think that's what you called it, Aaron. And at that point, we would need to do re-notification of abutters and that sort of thing. So, but let's hope that we can kind of keep progress moving forward and don't have to go down that road, but that would be another option. Yeah, so let's, let's, let's um, reconvene in the month and if that needs to happen, then that, if you feel like that needs to happen, then so be it. But hopefully we'll be able to have some significant progress by then. Okay. Okay, that sounds good. So Aaron, do you have any comments or does commissioners have any comments or questions and then we'll open to the public? I mean, I think my only comment is, um, you know, I've been a conservation agent for maybe 10 or 12 years now, and this is the second set of, well, it's a set of hearings really, because there's multiple notice of intent, but I've only had one other notice of intent that went over a year. Um, so it's very unusual to drag out um, a project this long and just for the sake of, a, um, a butter fatigue in following the situation that um, I would just really push for. I, I know the situation that Ted is in, but just that if we could get the information that's needed for us to make a decision, that would be particularly useful just because I get a lot of emails and comments every single meeting asking about it. And it's just, um, it's it's very resource intensive for the conservation department to respond to everything and be dealing with complaints about it taking so long and stuff like that so just would encourage in any way we can to keep it moving towards resolution yep. okay so any other do any of the commissioners have any comments besides echoing what aaron was saying Okay, so um, if there's anybody from the public who has anything they'd like to say, that you can just raise your hand and then we will allow that to happen. Okay, so I'm not seeing any at this point. So that means that uh, we're looking for a motion for a continuation and this would be for September 23rd. And what is the magical time, Aaron? Sorry, 7.30 p.m. I was on mute. <laughs> the anticipation was killing me. I was like, oh my God, what should you say? <laughs> um, I'll make the motion. To, uh, we'll move this um, to, to Fino NOI to September 27th at 7.30. 23rd. 23rd, 7.30. 23rd, sorry, 23rd. Yep. And this is for lots one, two, five, six, seven, and eight. Thank you, Fletcher. Second, Ed. Okay, thank you for seconding, Jen. So, Larry, your vote. You're on mute, so you'd have to yell really loud. 
<laughs> or like uh, four times. I, I have my space bar. Uh, Jen. Hi. Fletcher. Hi. Anna. Hi. And Leroy. Hi. And I for me as well. So thank you, Ted. So we will see you on the 23rd and any materials that you can send to Aaron ahead of time and the further ahead of time, um, the much appreciated. Very good. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, thank Ted. you, Ted. Okay, so moving on down the line. Um, so, yep, so we are fine to start up our eight o'clock, which is a request for determination. This meeting is being held as required by the provisions of chapter 131, section 40, the general laws of the Commonwealth and act relative to the protections of wetlands as most recently amended in the town of Amherst wetlands protection bylaw. This is a request for determination um, on, from Cold Spring Environmental on behalf of Kim DeShields. And this is for 97 Hull Street, uh, map 27D, lot 74. And so, Alan Weiss, I, we are promoting you to panelist. And so, Alan, if you wouldn't mind giving us, uh, introducing yourself and providing a little bit of background, that'd be great. Unmuted and we have video, yes? Great, we're here. Yes. How are you folks? Um, I first will apologize that my battery um, disappointed me last meeting. Um, I was going great and then it went out. Um, here we are um, and we are probably doing more in an appropriate time in terms of a butter notification and the project at hand. But just to reiterate, we just simply had a septic replacement that we were filing an RDA for um, last month. And at the suggestion of Ed Smith and Aaron, Jack, we um, went for emergency certification under the public health criteria of the septic um, really needing to be replaced uh, as soon as possible. And I'm happy to say that work is done. I forwarded Aaron um, both an as-built, which Ed Smith and I are in agreement is fine. Uh, this, the job is done to, uh, in effect. Um, the site has been properly uh, uh, completed, siltation control is up, uh, straw mulch is up, um, the system was put in as planned um, with no complications. Um, more than happy to go into more detail if you'd like, but that's the summary story. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Alan. So, Aaron, do you have um, some specifics you want to share? Sure. Um, so, um, this is located at 97 Hulse Road. Um, Leroy and I actually went out and took a site walk prior to the last meeting. The only reason we couldn't open the hearing at the last meeting was because um, about our notifications had gone out a little bit later. And um, we still do need the about our notification cards from um, Larry. So I'll hold off on releasing the determination until we get those, but I don't think there's any problem with issuing the approval at this point. The work has been done. It was permitted through the emergency certification. We just required the request um, as an after the fact um, sort of administrative um, permit because that's what would have been required if it had not been an emergency. Um, and let me see. This is what photo. Yep, yeah, so this, okay. this is what the, the current, um, and Alan just sent this over to me. So the site has been mulched and work is complete on the site. Um, so um, I would just recommend that the commission issue um, a negative determination. It's a, um, I believe it's box three. It's the, um, uh, um, work in a buffer zone, but it won't alter a wetland, and um, also a positive determination under the local bylaw. And no conditions needed on this one, Erin? There was conditions listed in the um, emergency certification, and I think really just um, that the site be stabilized is really the, the mm -hmm. only condition I would recommend since all work is completed at this point. Okay. So any comments or questions from the commission? Um, 
So there's one person from the public, Michael Liu, but I assume he's here for the next meeting. But Michael, if you have anything you want to say, just raise your hand. Okay. Um, so not hearing anything, uh, I guess we're looking for a motion with uh, those determinations and those conditions. So I make a motion to, this is a negative determination? Yes. Right, correct. Yeah, I make a motion for a negative determination for um, emergency, cert, emergency cert, correct? Um, it's it's a after the fact determination of applicability. After the fact determination of applicability on Holst, 97 Holst Road with the conditions um, and stabilization required. Seconded. Okay, thank you. So votes. So Jen. Hi. Fletcher. Hi. Larry. Hi. Anna. Hi. Leroy. Hi. And I from me as well. So I think we are good, Alan. And so you should be receiving some paperwork from Aaron shortly. Thank you. Two things. I'll remind Larry to send those into you, Aaron. And also, I'll keep an eye on things over the next few weeks as we um, wander through our tropical storm and thunderstorm season. That'd be great. <laughs> Thank All right, you. you Take care. Good night. You too. Bye bye. Okay. Um, so that concludes the, you know, everything that's on our official item list. Um, so Aaron, I assume that we want to do the Commonwealth stuff now since uh, we have Michael with us. Uh, the common school? Common school. Common school. Yes. yes. Yeah. Right, um, Michael, I will promote you to panelist. Okay. Um, and so Aaron, can you just sort of set us up for this one? Yeah. Um, so um, this past week, um, Mike Liu had communicated with me uh, that there was, due to COVID, there are some temporary learning areas that the common school needs to construct in order to um, administer some outdoor learning. Um, <laughs> And so they had planned four outdoor learning areas and basically started construction on them. And um, once I got the notification that construction began, I was like, whoa, 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 stop the train. <laughs> you need to get approval before you can do this. Um, myself and Dave Zomek met with um, Mike and uh, Kevin from the common school as well as the site supervisor. Um, I basically had recommended that one of the learning areas be eliminated from the project because it was located in the 30 foot no disturb area, which had already been excavated, but they have mulched it and seeded it or mulched it and covered it at this point and it has erosion controls around it. So they've sort of tried to mitigate the fact that they had done that work. Um, but we do have a revised plan from them, um, which I'll pull up momentarily unless um, Mike wants to pull it up on his end. Um, but I can, I also have access to it um, to kind of explain the right. um, changes. Well, Mike, I'm not sure if you need an introduction here, but if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and then sure. adding what you like. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm Michael Liu with the Berkshire Design Group representing the Common School. Um, I should note that Kevin Campbell was going to um, be um, checking in also. Um, he might, you know, check in to the meeting while this is in session. Um, I'm not sure if he necessarily has anything to offer, but I thought it'd be good for him to hear things firsthand anyway. Um, I wanna first apologize for this kind of, I'm calling it a mess. Um, unbeknownst to Berkshire Design Group, the school was pursuing, you know, some of these outdoor learning areas and um, things, you know, had progressed on that front to the point where they were obviously ready to start digging up the sod and replacing it with, you know, either a deck or stone dust areas. And obviously when the contractor came on board and started breaking ground, they probably had at t asked him, you know, can you do these also? And of course the contractor, you know, 
um, you know, complied with their wishes and started excavating and, and stripping the sod for these areas. Now, of course, when, when I heard about that, uh, Kevin came to me and said, wait a minute, we should, we should be asking the conservation commissioner of the town if this is, if, um, this is allowed. And I said, um, yes, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Um, so everything came to a standstill at that point. I think the school just got ahead of themselves. Um, obviously, if we had known about these, we could have included them on the original plan that we filed with you guys for the, for the uh, notice of intent. But um, being that as it may, we're coming here to hopefully get approval for minor administrative changes to the plan. Um, what you see in front of you now or on the screen are um, five areas um, shaded in red. Uh, it, if you can read it, area one and two are to the north of the school. Yeah, right there. Um, these are outside of the 100 foot buffer. The purple lines are the buffer zones. The outermost purple line is the 100 foot. Then the next one in is the 75 foot building setback. And then the next one in is the 30 foot setback. And the closest one to the wetlands is the 25 foot um, driveway setback. So one and two are outside of the uh, buffer zone. They're proposed to be on the north side of the school. They should have no impact on the wetland areas or buffer zones. Area number three, uh, next to the, right next to the building, that one um, is proposed to be right outside of a classroom. Um, that area was pre is within the 100 foot buffer zone at the 75 foot line as Aaron indicated there. And um, it previously was kind of like a wood chip area with some overgrown ewes around a, re a retaining wall that, that is at the north of that area. Um, the, the retaining wall was kind of falling down. They took the ewes out and um, kind of rebuilt that wall. And then they stripped the um, wood chips and any sod that was in that square, that rectangle area, which is 14 by 20. Um, up above it to the north where they ripped out the ewes, it's exposed soil. Um, I, don't, I don't know if they had uh, seeded it yet, but um, the other day when I was leaving the site, loam was arriving on site for them to place on that slope. And, and um, I am expecting that they had either have already seeded it or are, are, are doing that, you know, as we speak, you know, today or tomorrow. Um, they put also a, a, a straw wattle on the south side downslope of that, shown by that arced dashed line, um, more or less approximately in that location. Um, area four is over to the right hand side. As you can see, it's very close to the wetland and it's clearly within the 30 foot no disturb zone. Um, this area, they had stripped off the sod so that it's a depressed area about three or four inches deep. Um, no other work was done, but they did put a erosion control directly around it on three sides, um, east, west, and south. So it forms a tight U shape right up against that area. Um, they put uh, straw on top of the exposed soils in case any, um, you know, in case we get a rain and there might be a washout or, or you know, we don't want any, we want to prevent sediments from carrying in uh, to, toward the wetlands. But this area, they've um, basically said, yeah, okay, we understand it's in a no disturb zone. We'll abandon it. We will restore it. So the proposal for that area is to have it be restored back to a lawn area. Um, and then in lieu of that fourth area, they've want, they want to ask for permission to do area number five which is way over on the western part of the site. It's up against, if you're familiar with the site, there's like a, I think there's like an eight foot chain link fence um, that runs on the west side and on that south side that defines kind of like a, a field or an athletic field. So right at that, the north um, of the, the north end of the chain link fence, they want to put this um, 12 by 16 stone dust area. Um, it's, it's under some existing trees, so it's nice and shady. There would have to be, I look, was looking at, and I took some photos, which we can look at if you'd like. There's two branches that need to be pruned um, off of this, I believe it's a walnut tree, and um, to, to be able to make room because they also 
in, in each of these areas, they also want to add a simple, um, uh, I'm going to call it a portable tent. Uh, they're not going to dig any footings for these tents. They're just going to be um, the tent, you know, structures on poles and probably guide or, or stake to the ground. Um, they'll, they'll be easily removable. Uh, there's not going to be any permanent type of uh, shade structure or anything like that. Um, so those are the four areas. They want to do them all as stone dust and they all, uh, they want to put um, temporary um, tents for shade at each of these four areas. So we're looking at area one, two, three, and five. And area four is to be restored back to lawn. Um, I don't know if you wanna, I, I do have photos I can show you and I, I, I think I emailed those to you as well, Aaron. I don't know if you have those, um, but we can run through those really quickly if you'd like. If you're familiar with this site, um, that's fine. We can we can go on with comments or questions. I think some pictures would be great if we have them. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, good. You do. Have, okay. Great. So this is um, area one. It's about. It's going to be six by thirty, and it's basically an extension of this existing concrete um, um, deck. At the so this is on the north side at the back of the school. Is that actually going to be concrete, Mike? No, they want to do it in stone dust. Okay, all right. Just wanted to yeah. clarify that. Yeah. Okay. So the next oh, area. Hold on. Let me let me remove my uh, annotation. <laughs> oh, gosh. I don't know how to do it other than undo. Oh. Interesting effect. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Oops, sorry. Okay, so this is area two, also on the north side of the school. It will be between the building and the, and the fire lane. Um, so this area has been stripped already. They've already done some excavating associated with stump removal here and the, um, some regrading for the fire uh, lane, which you cannot see. It, it's directly to the right outside of the, the uh, field of view. But this area is, um, uh, I was told it was to be 12 by 16, also stone dust. And it's obviously, it's closely um, in close proximity to classrooms on this wing of the school. Um, this is area three. You can see the uh, retaining wall that they've rebuilt. The old railroad timbers had been kind of collapsing in this area. Right above Above the wall used to be some large U's. I think the U's probably were pushing against the wall. Um, but the, anyway, the, the, the retaining wall has been rebuilt. It's 14 feet wide by 20 feet long, 20 feet away from those doors. Um, and this area, they've, uh, they skimmed off the wood chips that were in this area and any sod, but um, Aaron strongly recommended that they, you know, use some spread straw on this area as well as the uh, area number four. So you can see the spread straw there. The um, straw waddles are down slope here that it was just temporarily open there for um, a vehicle to bring in some um, material, I believe, but that has been um, staked back into place, the uh, straw waddle. Um, this is area four uh, over, you know, within the 30 foot uh, wetland buffer zone. Um, so as you can see, they put um, uh, straw waddles tight to that area and put spread straw on the exposed um, soils there. And they were told not to do any work until after we've um, had a chance to come before the commission and get a decision. Um, this is area five. It's at the end of the chain link fence, which you see on the left. Uh, directly in front of you are the bran overhanging branches of the walnut tree. So basically the, the space would, the, the learning area would come out 16 feet from that fence um, underneath these branches. And again, it's proposed they, they wanna skim off the topsoil here and put in some stone dust um, for the learning area. Um, so I, 
think that's it for now. I would love, you know, if you have comments or questions, we can go through um, your any concerns that you have. Thank you, Michael. Um, so Aaron, do you have, you already showed pictures. I don't know if you have anything else you want to show or mention before we do Q&A. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I think my, my, we, Dave and I met with, with Mike and Kevin and expressed our concerns about this. Um, from where I sit, it was very close to being an enforcement situation. Um, they were out of compliance with their order of conditions. And I just, just generally speaking, there was a lot of work going on that was beyond the limit of work that was beyond the scope of what had been approved in the order of conditions. And so just, I know um, Kevin is on as an attendee listening and I know Mike is, is assisting the common school, but just really want to emphasize that any work that is happening in this area really needs to be communicated to us before it happens. And that includes any kind of ground disturbance, even if a, if a shrub is getting ripped out, if a tree is getting cut down, if a retaining wall is being replaced, we definitely need to know about it because these surprises can escalate very quickly into an enforcement situation or a cease and desist situation. And I know that you guys are on a tight timeline and just we don't want, we, the town does not want to have that happen. We want to make sure that all communication is clear and that, you know, we're um, aware of everything that's going on on the site. So I think that Kevin and Mike got that message loud and clear. And um, I think things are moving in a better direction now, but um, I just wanted to kind of express that. Thank you, Aaron. And yeah, I'm also going to promote Kevin to panelist. If Kevin wants to add anything. Um, so, commissioners, any comments or questions? I have a couple. So, um, Mike, the, oh, sorry, sorry. I, I do. Um, can you pull up the like first site drawing that you were annotating, just so I get the numbers of the outdoor spaces correctly as I try to ask a question. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. I guess I could pull it up on my own screen. Okay. So area three, is there any way, I mean, I know it's like tucked behind that, that retaining wall now is there any way they would consider moving that out of, wait, am I getting this right? Yeah, moving it out of the 100 foot. Like, it seems like we've done a lot of back and forth to like figure out how to make this work with the original changes proposed. And now we just have these like brand new, like, you know, similarly sized disturbances within the 100 foot. Do they have to be where they are? Is there anything we can do to relocate them outside of the buffers from the wetland? So I just I just want to jump in and make one point, and this is neither here nor there to your comment, Jen, but just to make it a point that yep. these are temporary areas. Um, and I and one of my questions is how temporary. So I kind of to your question, piggyback on that. <laughs> yeah, totally. And so related to that, what's the plan for not just the timing, but how will they be restored or taken out? Well, realizing that we nobody really has an answer to what temporary means at this point in time because of this COVID situation. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you know, in my my from my point of view, it'd be great to be able to keep these as you know permanent features at a school, especially. Um, but if they're if they have to be temporary, um, when when the emergency order is lifted, if the state if and when the state does that, these areas can be easily restored. Um, area five, especially out there on the end on the west end, can be restored to lawn. 
Um, the hopefully areas one and two being way outside the hundred foot um, buffer zone, you might not have an issue with if if they were to remain. But area three is 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 kind of unique because it, I mean it's right outside of a classroom, um, and having it be proximate to a classroom is seems like it's you know it would play a vital role um, in you know in how the school can run uh, event uh, programs and classes etc I you know I I can't answer the question whether or not it makes sense to move it somewhere else you know I'd have to I don't know if Kevin can answer can provide some comments or if the, you know if you want to get comments from the school but um, like area five to me is is kind of out there it's it's a ways you know but it's 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 you know it's still something that you know a teacher can lead a small class to that area way over to the west it's kind of a nice shady area um you know it's it's probably a, a, a pretty decent area to, to to do outdoor learning but i don't know i don't know specifically the function of that classroom in the building that at area three if it's for little kids for instance and um, if that's why that's, you know, directly outside those doors, um, it's, you know, that would be my suspicion that it's, it's probably more geared for little kids. Um, and certainly like area four being away uh, over there on the, on the east side, I think some, somebody at the school picked that area and just, you know, just had no idea that it, it had, um, you know, wetland ramifications. Um, and there's, you know, they were very agreeable to, to restore it and not do any other work there. It was, a, it was a mistake. They just went too fast. But um, getting back to area three, I, it, you know, I mean, it doesn't make sense to try to push it uphill away from, you know, that door, because then it becomes harder to access. Once you step out the door, then you've got to go up the slope. Um, so it's in a, it's in a kind of a, I guess, maybe think of, call it a unique situation that there's a classroom on the lower floor of that building, you know, and, but they have direct access, you know, to this area right outside. And it was previously used as an outdoor space. There were wood chips placed there, um, you know, in, in the previous, uh, you know, pre-construction conditions. So I think they were kind of using it either for a small play area or some type of gathering space you know, right outside of that classroom. If, if I can jump in, assuming everybody can hear me okay. Yeah, we can. And um, can you also just introduce yourself real yeah, quick? Yeah, I'm Kevin Campbell, and I'm the project coordinator for the Common School. Thank you. And um, uh, Mike and I have sort of ramped up to speed on this project with, with an equally steep trajectory. It, <laughs> it came upon us pretty pretty quickly. But um, the logic of it, regardless of the mistakes that were made, is, is become pretty clear to me, both as a former educator, former head of school, and now as a consultant, that, that I completely understand in response to your question, what's driving the locations. Um, the first thing that's driving location is, is the, simple, the simple topography and, 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 and um, boundaries of this campus. It's small to begin with. It has a fair amount of structures, all permanent structures already in place, including driveways and everything, so it's reducing the amount of available area for anything. And then it has the, um, the buffer zones and the various buffer zones limitations. So, so there, there, there aren't a lot of, um, the, meaning it's three acres gets shrunk pretty quickly if you've ever been over to campus. Um, the second thing and the more important thing is that every one of these these locations was selected by the teachers to be as proximate as possible to their to a classroom. So that's why there are five of them for the five different learning levels. And um, in in the case of in the case of number three, that that is yes that that you know without the awareness factor, but that was um, that's a that's a very young group, kindergartners, first graders or so, and um, the idea is you want to keep them, you know, they, we, they're just trying to create extensions to their classrooms, someplace to step out to for the single reason that you all have become so aware of nowadays of 
increasing um, the quality, if you will, of the, of, of, of the air they breathe, ventilation, so that they can spend as much time outdoors as possible, reducing their, their the health uh, risk limitations. So number three just happened because of its, as Mike mentioned, its pre-existing condition, which was the retaining wall was there. There was actually an existing bench around the retaining wall. Nothing is changing, and there were wood chips, so they were using it in that. That that is that is how that sort of, and Mike said, became sort of natural. We spent over an hour last Saturday morning walking the campus with the teachers, with the admin team, um, trying to just trying to find what became um, area number five. That's how difficult it was. Um, to find any a single area that that wasn't either you know treed or or filled with roots or um, or had some had some terrain that wasn't a great place um, and uh, that was the best place and even that place now will take up a part of you know sort of compromise a little bit of what is their small sort of outdoor ball field area so um, so that's 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 the best answer I, I can give you is that they're limited in a few ways and I didn't see that whole walk if, if we were pleased to find number five uh, the thought of finding you know call it a number six a replacement for three um, would be really tricky but more importantly it would it would make it would defeat the purpose of the little ones being able to spill right outside into a safe place that's very close by um, and uh, that's, that's that, as far as I understand from the school, that's been their logic for the selections. Um, Thanks. One follow-up question I have, and this we had touched on briefly. Um, I know that is it the, the Conservation Commission holds a conservation restriction, which limits impervious surface, um, and I know part of the reason for the change in the pervious pavers was to add a little bit more impervious surface to try to comply with that. Um, and I'm, I know, um, Mike, you had mentioned kind of crunching some numbers a little bit and looking at how these areas were going to affect that. And I know you had mentioned it might be nice to keep some of the areas after the mm -hmm. fact. Um, I'm just wondering how that impacts the impervious surface cover on the property in relation to the amount that's allowed in the CR. Well, we, to take a step back, we added the impervious uh, paving on the fire lane and these parking spaces, which are shown around the, this turnaround. To get the uh, to get the impervious on the site below twenty five percent, and that figure was twenty four point nine. Um, when we add any more impervious, it's certainly going to get us bring us over twenty five percent. These air these four areas, I was I didn't know how big they were going to be, but when I cr initially crunched some numbers, I just assumed they were all going to be two hundred and fifty square feet for a total of a thousand square feet. Um, they are in fact smaller than, mm -hmm. or, or the total I added it up, it's like 840 square feet. But let's just say we have a, if we add a thousand square feet, I think the percentage points that we're adding is like, uh, I, I think it was 0.6 or 0.7% um, of coverage. Um, now, when we presented this to the planning board, they did, agree to a condition that the school follow up on um, getting the conservation restriction revised from 25 to 30% lot coverage. If that is done within three, within the three years, which the, con, which they, the condition that they granted, you know, we don't have anything to worry about. <laughs> um, but, you know, obviously, it's 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 a little bit. It, it would be out of compliance with the current CR, um, and I know you know we've talked about this with Dave Zomek um, a couple of times and everything. And I, I you know I I hate to 
ask, you know, for any more favors, because I think we're already pushing our luck, but there's, you know, this site is very unique in that it's a small site. It's taken up by a lot. It's taken up by buildings. There's a long driveway. There's not a lot that can, that you can do here. Um, but given the situation, you know, this emergency situation with COVID and schools grappling with how to provide, you know, alternatives to classroom space and trying to do these outdoor learning areas, you know, there's just, there's no choice that we, we have. They, they cannot be grass. They cannot be wood chip. They have to be either decking or the bill. My understanding is that the building inspector um, ruled that they can be stone dust. Okay. Um, I was just I was just trying to condition them in a temporary way and trying to kind of yeah. conceptualize how to do that. Like if we say they're conditioned for one year, they're conditioned for three years and, you know, to try to kind of stay in compliance with that as much as possible. Yeah. I don't think that the board can approve them as permanent. Aaron, if I can, I, I think I think if I can give you a range to to narrow your grappling, maybe it would help. I, um, I would, I would say it's very, very important for the school that they know um, how they start the year. That's how the year can be. Okay, for the whole year, that it wouldn't get pulled out from under them um, at some point mid-year. That they're going to they're they're building this into their curriculum. They're building it into the very fabric of their school. So if it could last for at a minimum, the length of the school year, that would be one, um, one bookend, I think, to the time, the, the, to the definition of temporary. And then I think the other definition of temporary would be if we could tie it to uh, the, um, the timeline we've been given to, um, to uh, obtain the amendment to the, to the, to the deed restriction. So, um, if that at least narrows it down, but I, I I think if it's less than if it's less than the school year, and I would say a year from it, you know, if you approve this tonight, a year from uh, the start of this school year, because that would include probably have to include their even their summer offerings next summer. Um, that would that would be uh, you know an important starting point, um, and and of course. To Mike's point of of you know the idea of permanence, if they could possibly um, have the time, which we don't foresee taking, we're going to jump on this amendment as soon as we finally get the school up and running. So that that is the next priority. As soon as okay. school opens and the project is done, is to start the amendment process. We're so I just I just well, I I apologize. I don't mean to interrupt, but we have a bunch of other business we've got to do tonight. So. I would like to just see if the commission is amenable to like a one to three year temporary, temporarily allowing this as a um, a minor amendment to the order. Um, just kind of put it out there to the board to see if anybody objects to that. Um, just because I don't, I see people glazing over it and we have other stuff we have to get to. So I don't want to burn everybody out right now. <laughs> I have a couple of other questions. I don't know if other commissioners do as well. And so one, Mike, that slope that's right behind the building, I think that's area number three. Is that going to be stabilized at somehow as well? Yeah, they're already working on it. They, I know that they were bringing in topsoil right. and they, they were okay. going to have it seeded. It's already and, been seeded, Mike, in topsoil. Oh, okay. All right. That's great. Um, I think and that's... So, okay. Okay, anyway, and go ahead. And as far as the surfaces are concerned, so the stone dust is basically impervious? I think in, in yes, it's, in practice. it's considered in impervious, <laughs> an impervious surface. Have you it, thought it, about um, pervious pavers or something like that? Or I don't know, that's more permanence a problem though, but some alternative. I heard you say that you couldn't do chips and that sort of stuff, but. Yeah, well, I, there's there's some building code type issues that I'm not familiar with, but you know, if it if it's a learning space, it can't it can't be a combustible material. Well, it, it, let, let me let like me that. just quickly respond to the pavers that 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 that, that we did do um, on the site. Uh, we'd have to do more pavers 
uh, then, so if, if we have a thousand square feet, we'd have to do 2000 square feet of pavers because you only count them by 50%, um, right, Mike? Right, with, with um, so this type of paper. we have another thousand square feet of pavers to cover the 1000 square feet. The second thing is just a more practical point. There, the students will be sitting under here in chairs. Okay, and, so and, yeah, they just wouldn't work. Yeah, that would be a little awkward. Yeah. We, we were advocates of decking, um, but uh, we thought that would be even less uh, impervious, more pervious. We had spacing in it and everything, but, but uh, the uh, building commissioner said no, that that was considered um, impervious as well. So we tried to go down that road. Uh, he, but he thought for the sake of the school that actually it was much less expensive, much easier to dismantle and, and put back into, into, into uh, condition when temporary expired. Okay. If, and so there is a plan. And so if they, once they, let's say that they are temporary, you guys would just scrape out the stone and then reseed yep. or something. It would be an easy, much easier process to remove the stone dust, you know, the, the two to three inches of stone dust rather than like, you know, take take decking and you know a yeah. structure part. for what it's worth we have um a mountain of stone dust that we just tore up <laughs> in our driveway so it doesn't cost the school anything either which is a big factor on the school's end we just simply can grab and use what we were going about about to haul off of the site so it can be re repurposed okay sounds good thank you so how about other commissioners any other questions or comments? We okay moving forward as long as they re, um, yeah, take out that that problematic one. What was that number four? Um, number four. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And I mean, at this point, it sounds like you guys are going to have four, but you really wanted five. And I guess if you're going to put in a fifth, you guys will come back in front of us. Yes. If we find one, yeah. Okay. Okay. So it sounds like we are in pretty good shape at this point then. Um, so I assume that we need to, <clears throat> it's informal amendment, but I assume that we should probably do a vote on this, Aaron. Yeah, you'll definitely need a vote and I would definitely condition the temporary nature of the pads as part of the motion. Okay, and so the motion is for an amendment to the existing work uh, with those conditions. Uh, a minor administrative change to the order of conditions. Okay, thank you. I can try it. So you're saying, okay, so, nope, I can't try it. Okay, so let me restate it. So it, um, what we're asking for is a motion for a minor administrative change to the order of conditions okay. with a condition uh, proving the temporary learning areas for a period of one to three years. All right, I'm going to start it. And then if I mess it up, just jump in for me. So, all right, I move for a minor administrative change to the order of conditions. That's good for one to three years. I missed a whole bunch in the middle there. Uh, temporary learning areas. Temporary learning areas. Thank you. Yeah, the phrase, the Sorry. phrase so moved works pretty well as. <laughs> I wasn't sure if that was legit, if I could just do that. <laughs> oh yes, it's legit. I, like I needed to say the whole thing. All right, so moved. <laughs> Second. Okay, Larry. Aye. Jen. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Anna. Aye. Leroy. Aye. And aye. So we are good. Paperwork is forthcoming. All right. Thank you, all again. Thank, you. Thank you guys so much. All You're right. Welcome. And yeah, just to reiterate, but obviously you know this. Um, yeah, if anything else is happening on there, please let Aaron know. Yep. Yep. All right. Absolutely. Thank um, you. Great. Have a great meeting. Thank you for the rest Thank of your meeting. Well, Thanks. We're almost done. Anna, that's the advantage of being recorded because that you can say so moved because you've been said. Uh -huh. I will never forget again. <laughs>
Well, you always do such a valid attempt anyway. So, and, and sometimes you get it too. Yeah, I don't think we can no. give Anna. I don't think we can give her a hard time at all. She's always the one trying when the rest of us are like. <laughs> I'm really happy that that's what I'm known for. <laughs> you. No, I meant that in a good way. Yeah, Jen, you though would nail it every time. It's like, Jen's like, got it down. <laughs> I know. We could all every time. That's why we don't say so moved anymore because Jen's like, no, no, no. I'm just going to Seriously. Say <laughs> Impressive that's she, always. That's because Jen cherry picks the one that she does it for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm actually studying the whole time. Yeah, right, right. You know, <laughs> I start, I started like Tuesday morning. Nice. Great. <laughs> okay. So Erin, do you want to keep us moving? Yes. Nah. Uh, so <laughs> Beth Wilson, DPW contacted me this morning. Um, I guess Mass DOT was out doing bridge inspections yesterday, the day before yesterday, uh, the afternoon of the 24th, they were out doing bridge inspections and they came across this pedestrian bridge, which is on West Street. Um, and it was deemed structurally unsafe. So they, DPW was out there, um, maybe I'm getting the date wrong, maybe it was yesterday. Anyways, they put up these Jersey barriers to block access to it and um, requested an emergency certification to uh, basically demo and um, rebuild slash repair, I think, um, According to Beth, some of the um, uh, I beams or support beams under the bridge were actually going to be um, preserved. Let me see. What's this going over? Yeah. Um, it's going over Plum Brook. And um, so I, I issued an emergency certification to. Beth and in doing so um, required that she speak to natural heritage because it is natural heritage endangered species area and um, obviously they need to be um, you know privy to what's going on and I don't know why sorry I'm gonna are you guys seeing my screen right now nope. yeah we see folders uh, sorry I don't really want you to see it just because I'm navigating um give me just one second yeah so this is pretty close to moan and dove yeah. yes okay. yep yep exactly um there's a house for sale and it's like right across the street from it um sorry i was looking to see if i could put my finger on it oh there it is and i was looking to see if i could find the correspondence as well from from Beth but this is just as good because it actually provides the um, I apologize this is kind of it's it's a little tricky for me to share because I've <laughs> got to navigate my personal screen the, the screen of my personal computer and then I'm also remoted in okay so um, this is the description. Uh, demolition of the bridge will consist of removing pavement, decking, railings, and two I-beams. There's a water line beneath the bridge that will be left in place, not disturbed. The abutments are, oh, excuse me, the abutments are in good shape um, and will be reused for the new bridge. Some minor repairs may be needed. Um, replace, new, put in new I-beams um, on existing abutments, laying new decking. They'll use silt socks to protect the banks. Um, and so the conditions I added to the permit were um, no material stone riprap asphalt may enter the stream. DPW must coordinate with Natural Heritage Endangered Species Program. Erosion control and steam, uh, stream protection must be installed as noted in the narrative from Beth. Upon completion of any work, all exposed spoils must be stabilized with mulch and seed, and DPW shall notify the commission when the work is complete and provide photographs of the completed work. But we can modify this however you want. Um, if you have any additional question, you know, conditions that you want to add to this, or you could just ratify it in its current state. It's really up to you guys. Yeah, looks pretty straightforward to me. I'm fine with ratifying it. 
So we would just need a motion to ratify the um, emergency certification that was issued to DPW for the pedestrian bridge on West Street. So I'm moved. We ratify. Oh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> that was it. Second. I just said so moved. Oh, second. I said, oh. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So voting, Jen. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Anna. Aye. Larry. Unmute that, buddy. It's gone. <laughs> Like it always. <laughs> there it goes. It took, it took a while, but I, I'm using the space bar. It took a while to work. The yeah, eye. Leroy? Aye. And I for me as well. So CERT is certified. Perfect. So I'll just, I'm just going to run through a couple extra things. Um, as a follow up to last week, um, UMass had um, provided a notification to us about the repaving project on University Drive. I followed up with their engineers and they said that they've actually reduced impervious surface um, and they provided a correspondence to that effect. They said if you need more information or want to, you know, have somebody attend a meeting, they're happy to do so. Just no. Okay. I was impressed that they were able to reduce it. I'm not exactly sure how, but okay. I'll take them at their word. Okay. Let me just double check because I know there was some other business I wanted to tell you. Um, oh, yes. Um, we have a request for certificate of compliance for 159 Belchtown Road. Um, basically, what it is, it's um, there's a subdivision called Pally Place there and when the place was when the subdivision was originally constructed it was like one big piece that was subdivided when the order of conditions was issued um, one of the subdivided lots was included in the order of conditions and no work was taking place on that lot it's a it was an existing apartment building on its own separate lot um, and the people were looking to get a certificate of compliance on that. I did pull the plans from the archive and review the original order of conditions and the plans and confirmed that there was no work that was proposed on the said lot. Um, so basically um, we would just need an order of condition or um, a, a motion that um, released that particular lot from the order of conditions. And I can get you details. Just give me one quick moment to get to the request. Is it 20 assessors map plot number map and plot number 21B parcel 18? 159 Old Belchertown Road. Um, sorry, I was um, pulling this up as yeah. you were talking. Yeah. Um, yes, so this is the um, information from the um, attorney. So, so it's to issue a certificate of compliance for that specific this specific lot and it and and it would be um the box that you would be that we would check on the certificate of compliance is that work never started on this lot there was there was never any work done in association with the order of conditions on this lot work never began on this lot so it's just kind of singling that out um it's not stating that anything was done there as part of the order Straightforward enough. So I move we issue a certificate com of compliance for uh, assessor's map and plot number 21B, parcel 18 at 159 Old Belchertown Road in Amherst, Mass. And the certificate of compliance should indicate that no work was done on the lot in question. Perfect. Looking for a second. Second. Okay, so going to a vote, Jen. 
Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Anna. Aye. Larry. Aye. Leroy. Aye. And I for me as well. I am making Jen a crown that says Queen of Emotion. That uh, was the team. Not bad. The team. <laughs> no, no, no. Take the win, man. Take the win. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I believe that is all the the main business items. I just wanted to update as long as we're talking about Pally Place. I had mentioned the previously that um, I was working with a gentleman to help him put together an RDA and he is on the verge of submitting for that shed. Um, he's probably going to be on for the 23rd of September, but his shed is being delivered probably around that date. So he is, he, I'm working with him to get it submitted so that he's not you know, so that he's in compliance basically, but it's coming. So, okay, sounds good. Anything else? Um, there's no other standout issues, thank god. <laughs> right, nice. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you for keeping us moving. And so, with that, I think we're just looking for a final motion for adjournment. <laughs> so, move. <laughs> looking for a sec. Okay, Jen. Aye. Fletcher. Aye. Anna. Aye. Larry. Aye. Leroy. Aye. And I for me as well. So we are done and recording is almost.